rubber. It's used everywhere, but I usually associate it with car tires. It's plentiful and relatively cheap, but not so long ago, that wasn't the case. In fact, some countries would go to such extreme lengths to get it that they basically committed genocide. This one's gonna be depressing. Today, we're looking at the dark history of rubber and the material's connection to one of the most heinous crimes in history. Rubber is super important in the car world. All the horsepower your car makes would mean nothing if the power didn't get put to the ground through your tires. In fact, if you want to improve the performance of any car, the first place you should start is by upgrading the tires. Rubber is used in other crucial places too. Weather seals keep your interior safe from the elements, and your car probably relies on super strong rubber belts on the front of the engine to keep everything running. Without rubber, cars would probably not exist as we know them. Before we really get into things, first you have to know that there are two kinds of rubbers, natural and synthetic. Nowadays, most rubber you come in contact with was derived from petroleum. Through the process of styrene copolymerization, we get styrene butadiene rubber. Not quite sure what that means, but it's really durable and can stand up to road use. But before synthetics were developed, rubber had to be made another way, which was a lot harder. Natural rubber comes from a tree called the rubber tree. Harvesters carve a line into the tree's trunk, causing it to bleed a milky sap. This substance is called latex. The sap drips down the tree into a bucket where it's collected by harvesters who let it coagulate and then it's pressed and dried ready for manufacturing use. Civilizations as old as the Olmec in Central America used rubber harvested from the trees. They use natural rubber to make textiles waterproof and to make balls for a game called poke to poke The wonderfully bouncy material made its way to Europe in the mid-1700s, and all of a sudden, the continent fell in love with it, and any imperial country with colonies overseas, i.e. most of them, started planting rubber trees wherever they would grow. Britain had rubber plantations in India, and the Dutch had rubber growing in the East Indies. A little country called Belgium found somewhere a little less crowded. The first king of independent Belgium was King Leopold. He died in 1865 and was succeeded by his second born son, Leopold II. He didn't really have that much power. His only responsibilities really were addressing parliament, attending the funerals of dead statesmen, and greeting big wig guests. That sounds pretty boring. Leopold wanted more. He wanted a colony. He wanted to make some money. But where could Belgium set up shop? First, he wanted to buy a province in Argentina, but that didn't really work out. Then, he offered to buy Borneo from the Dutch, and they said no, so he went to Spain and, no joke, asked if he could lease the Philippines. They also said no. Honestly, dude, you're coming off pretty desperate. And it's not like the Belgian parliament was standing behind him, because they weren't. Colonies were stupid expensive, and they didn't believe Leopold had justification for establishing one, but he did anyway. He set his eyes on the area known as the Congo. Through a complicated scheme of hiring shell companies that he owned, Leopold enlisted explorer Henry Morton Stanley to purchase land from the native Congo inhabitants. Unfortunately, the Congolese didn't really understand the terms of Stanley's deals and sold their land for pennies. In short time, Belgium had a claim of a vast swath of Western Africa, about a million square miles. In 1885, King Leopold established the Congo Free State. It was an ironic name, really, because Leopold was not concerned with making the Congo a better place to live, nor improving the life of its inhabitants. The only thing Leopold cared about was making Leopold some money. The equatorial climate made the Congo prime for rubber tree cultivation, so Leo had huge portions of forest cleared out to make room for rubber tree saplings. Once the trees had enough latex in them to harvest, Leopold ran into another problem, finding people to harvest it. Like a lot of other colonies, the Congolese didn't really care about rubber. They didn't use it and they weren't getting paid, so why would they harvest it? That why wasn't Leopold's problem, since he decided he would just make them do it. Instead of mandating taxes like the British colonies in North America did, for instance, King Leopold designated these commodities as a tax for living in his colony. So if you don't want to harvest rubber, that's fine. Just harvest enough rubber for us on your own time, 
and then when you get enough, you can do whatever else you want. But the quota didn't really make much sense, and it was essentially slavery. So the people of the Congo just refused to do it. Leopold didn't like that. So he authorized his people to use other means of motivation. One such method was brutally whipping anyone who refused to harvest rubber. Belgian officers and hired mercenaries called the Force Publique would use a special whip made from hippopotamus hide called a chicote that did horrific damage. But they went even further. In perhaps one of the most brutal acts in modern history, Leopold's men would cut off the hands of anyone who didn't meet their quotas. I didn't say cutting the hand. I said cutting off the hand. Leopold's goons would roll up on a village, and if the citizens didn't have their quota of rubber waiting for the squads, they'd just start taking hands. They'd also burn down the living spaces, kill the women and kidnap children to train as soldiers who would repeat the process. What was driving all this demand for rubber? Among other things like wiring insulation and belts for machinery, the popularity of the bicycle was skyrocketing all over Europe, and they needed natural rubber for the tires. With demand so high, King Leopold couldn't help but see only dollar signs growing from his trees in the Congo. As rubber production went up, so did Leopold's expectations. His officers on the ground made higher and higher demands of the Congolese, and they just couldn't keep up. Surprisingly, the same went for the roaming terror squads. The Force Publique had quotas of their own, to prove to leadership that they used their ammunition to kill uncooperative workers instead of using it for hunting, the force public would bring back severed hands to their commanders. These hands would be accepted in place of rubber. So, being human, the squads decided it would just be easier to collect hands instead. As a result of Leopold II's insatiable hunger for wealth, and abhorrent treatment of his colony, it is estimated between 6 and 12 million Congolese lost their lives. They died from diseases like smallpox and sleeping sickness, outright violence, and bleeding out from their severed wrists. Journalists and books like Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness spread the word of what was happening in the Congo, stoking outrage around the world. Facing backlash from the global community and pressure from parliament at home, the king gave up control of the Congo to Belgium in 1908. Leopold died the next year without ever having set foot in Africa. Over a hundred years later, the Congo's natural resources are still desirable to companies around the world. But since tire manufacturers have mostly shifted to synthetic rubber, latex is no longer the Congo's main export. The next big thing is cobalt. If you have electronics like these with lithium ion batteries, it's likely they also contain cobalt which basically makes the batteries work. Over 50% of the world's cobalt comes from the Congo, mined by people equipped only with shovels and working for very little money. UNICEF and Amnesty International say that around 40,000 children are also involved in mining operations. Electric cars also use batteries containing cobalt, but fortunately they're being designed to use a lot less of the material every year. Tesla recently committed to using battery material only from North America, and engineers are starting to make a ton of headway on lithium titanate batteries, which need zero cobalt to operate. Nowadays, we take rubber for granted, but not too long ago, many people lost their lives because of greed over it. So be kind, y'all. Thanks for watching Wheelhouse. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that yellow button right there. Check out last week's episode of Wheelhouse right here, and check out this science garage on tires. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes, follow Donut at Donut Media. Be nice, I'll see you next time.